fellow redeemed in the blood of our now risen and now ascended Lord Jesus. There's a hymn in our hymnal that we sing usually in the fall during the uh, end times season. We don't have it in our bulletin today. The hymn is titled, The World is Very Evil. Perhaps you remember it. And as time goes on, don't we see and experience that ourselves? The world is very evil. Especially for us as Christians, the world around us seems to become increasingly hostile. Our faith, our beliefs, our creeds, the teachings which drive us, which lead us, they come under attack. And of course, this isn't unique only to us, is it? In fact, what we have here today in our current situation in Northwest Ohio is, is much easier, far better than many Christians have it elsewhere in the world. Far better, much easier than many Christians have had it in the history of the church. There have been countless individuals who have faced untold hardships and sufferings for the cross of Christ. But you know, sometimes as we face difficulties and hardships, when we are persecuted or mocked or ridiculed for what we believe, we sometimes act as if we're so surprised and we get rather upset. There are times when people will come up to me as a pastor and they'll say something like, can you believe what that television show did? Can you believe what they said and how they mocked Jesus like that? Or they point to some public figure. And they say, can you believe that person? Did you hear what he had to say about the church? Or they reference some event or some goings on in our community. And they say, can you believe this? This used to be such a Christian nation. But now we can't even pray. We can't even mention God's word to other people without them getting all offended. Just this past week, it, it's been all over the, uh, some of the news stories about how people want to cancel this television show, Duck Dynasty, just because they show them praying and talking about the Bible. Sometimes when people come up and they express such things, pastors will respond by saying, Why, yes, I can and I do believe that these things are happening. In fact, Jesus himself told me to believe it, and to expect it. So really, actually, in a way, I'm thankful that these things are taking place because it reaffirms to me that Jesus proclaims the truth and that we should listen to him. And really, isn't it a gentle reminder also to us that our focus and that our attention should not be on this fallen, sinful, ever evil world around us, but that our attention, our focus, should be towards that ultimate goal of the Christian. To see and to experience heaven. Now, of course, Jesus faced all sorts of hardships and persecutions while he was living here on earth. His enemies hated him. They despised him. But now, as, as we mentioned, we celebrated this past Thursday, Jesus ascended into heaven. And that object, which the enemies of Christ now turn upon, that they now hate and that they now direct their evil efforts towards, are those who follow Jesus, Jesus' disciples. Now, dear friends, do you realize what that means for us, who are now Jesus' disciples? It means that nothing should come as a surprise to us. We should expect to face hardships and difficulties for what we believe. Have no doubt about it. If you hold to Christ Jesus, you will in some way be mocked and attacked and ridiculed for it. That's the point of our spiritual enemies. They're trying to do anything that they can to take you and to rip you out of God's hands. And so to prepare his disciples, to make them ready to withstand these attacks, our Lord shares with us the words that we find today in our text. These are words which we want to look at now, 
recorded in John chapter 15, verse 20, going through John 16, verse 4, we hear how Jesus readies his disciples to face hostilities from the world. Please rise as we hear these words in Jesus' name. Jesus said, Remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they did not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I, had done, if I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. And we pray, these are your words, Heavenly Father, sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Please be seated. Now, dear friends, Jesus' disciples are to be ready to face a hostile attitude from the world. And what kind of attitude might this be? Well, Jesus uses a very strong word in our text when he references this attitude from the world. He speaks of it as hate. Hatred. The kind of hatred that has no cause. This was, of course, a hatred that Jesus himself faced. Even when he was a little baby, Joseph, Mary, and Jesus, they had to flee for their lives because Herod wanted to kill this newborn king. As Jesus was growing up, we heard that, yes, he grew in favor with God and among men. But then when he began his public ministry, the moment he went and he told those self-righteous Pharisees the truth about their sins, it was the truth. He wasn't making things up. He proclaimed the truth about their sins. They hated him for it. They hated him and his truth, which they knew was true, so much that they obsessed about getting rid of him, about shutting him up. Shutting him up eventually by means of an unjust trial and an unjust death. Once they thought that Jesus was out of the picture, then their hatred turned upon those who were following him, and who kept pointing people back to him and to his truth, and to that message of both law, pointing out your sins, but then gospel, the forgiveness of those sins. In fact, that's why we have the book of Acts in our Bibles, a big reason, because in it we see very clearly these words of Jesus are fulfilled. The apostles and disciples of Christ faced all sorts of hatred and vitriol from the people that they were preaching to. It was all because of that message about the truth that they were proclaiming, pointing people to Jesus, to why he came into this world, because of our sins, but then also pointing to them, pointing to him as the forgiveness of our sins. <coughs> Hatred. The world will hate Jesus' followers. Again, this should come as no surprise. And really, this is the nature of all men. That sinful nature of men. Every single one of us possesses, by nature, a hatred of God. 
We have that old sinful Adam inside of us that constantly seeks to come out and to manifest itself in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions. And this old sinful Adam that seeks to break out in ourselves is, is no friend of God. It is an ally instead of the devil. He hates Jesus, wants nothing to do with him, looks at Jesus as someone who can hold him back from doing what he really wants to do. And so when those who, who suppress that old Adam, when those who take that old Adam and drown him and let that new man who has been made righteous by Christ come out and express himself in their lives, when such people are hated by the world, it should come as no surprise. For it is today the same as it was at Jesus' time. The world still <coughs> hates Jesus and it hates those who make Jesus the object of their faith and of their lives. Jesus' disciples should also be prepared and ready not only to face a hostile, angry, angry, hostile attitude, but also we should be ready and prepared to face hostile actions from the world around us. The world is fighting against us. Just look at the examples already given in Scripture about how they fought and expressed this, this action against those who believed in Jesus. We're told about that man who was born blind, but Jesus healed him. He wouldn't stop talking about Jesus. And so Jesus' enemies then took that blind man who had been healed and kicked him out of the synagogue. <coughs> he kicked him out of their community. They disowned him and ostracized him. Or think of Lazarus. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. The very fact that Lazarus was living was a, was a proclamation about Jesus and about who he was. But remember how Jesus' enemies were seeking even to once again kill Lazarus, put him back to death. The disciples, Jesus' disciples, they were scorned, they were shunned, their very lives were threatened, and eventually they were taken away from them, all because of their confession of faith in Jesus Christ. Scripture tells us that it got to the point, as Jesus predicted, that those who were going around persecuting Christians, who were getting rid of them and doing anything bad against them, were viewed as, as being noble and, and good in the eyes of society. For instance, when St. Paul, before he became St. Paul, he was known as Saul. He was the persecutor of the church, going door to door, hunting down Christians to arrest them and to see that they were killed. And he was lauded as a hero for doing it. So dear friends, are you, are you prepared and ready for this to happen again today? Not only to face hostile attitudes, but hostile actions from the people and from the world around us. You know, things could change. So that certainly right here in our own midst, in our own country, in our own state, in a few years, things could change, that this could happen again. In fact, we have seen that it has happened throughout the course of history where Christians have become persecuted. During the Reformation, Lutherans who confessed their faith in Christ alone as their sole Messiah, in Christ who was the bringer of full and free grace, that confession of faith meant that many Lutherans, those who confessed it, were accused and were convicted of being heretics. They were arrested, even brutally killed for these beliefs. It could happen again. But again, should it come as a surprise to us? Don't the last verses of our text make very, very clear that these things are going to happen? Hasn't Jesus himself foretold it? Hasn't he warned us? So that when we see these things happening, we might then put our faith even more and trust even more in his word for strengthening. As he says in the final verse of our text, I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, 
you may remember that I told them to you. Jesus gives us these warnings so that we might be prepared and ready to face these things when they come head on at us. But even more than that, as our text explains, Jesus is really arming us. He is readying us and preparing us. He is training us to face these things. And he does so by giving us the truth. Jesus said to Pilate as he was on trial, Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And you remember, of course, how Pilate responded. He scoffed at that. He said, well, what is truth? Jesus had already explained many times before what truth was. He prayed to God the Father, and we pray it every Sunday before our sermons, your word is truth. Recall also how Jesus himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Likewise, the Holy Spirit, whom Jesus promises in our text to send, that helper, to come from the Father, he is called the Spirit of Truth. But what truth exactly does Jesus, does God the Father, does this Holy Spirit proclaim to us? That arms us and readies us and prepares us. Well, it's the truth about ourselves. It's the truth, dear friends, about our great need that we have. The truth that our own sinfulness is so great that we can't even begin to comprehend it fully. But it is also the truth about God's love for us, which is far greater than our sinfulness. That love that we find in Christ, which is also a love that we can't comprehend. When we are armed with this, with, with this truth, about our sinfulness, and also this truth about our righteousness that comes to us through faith in Christ Jesus. That, dear friends, is when we are prepared and ready to go and face the hostility from the world around us. Armed with this great truth of the gospel, we can keep things in perspective. We can keep that ultimate goal of heaven in sight. And not let the world's hostility, not let its, its attempts get the better of us. Not let it rip us out of God's hands. And so to strengthen his disciples and to build their confidence in this truth, Jesus promises, as he does in our text, to send this helper, the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit, who will come and, as Jesus explains, will bear witness to us about this truth, and who will also bear, bear witness through us to others about that truth. The Holy Spirit will come and will work in us, and He will work through us to help the world, to help them hear about the only one who has ever overcome the world, about the Savior Jesus. I love it how St. Paul speaks about the sword of the Spirit. And he points out that that is the Word of God. We have the Holy Spirit, and He has promised to work through the Word. And it's a sword. A sword, of course, is something that you can use two ways. You can use it defensively, you can block with it. But you can also use it offensively, you can strike with it. We take God's Word in this way, the sword of the Spirit. And we can, of course block the attacks of the world around us, using the word, being strengthened in the truth. But we can also use it to strike at the devil, to strike at the world, to strike at our own flesh, that old sinful Adam that's an enemy of God. We can strike down these enemies by proclaiming, by pointing to, and by reflecting to, by reflecting this love that we see in Jesus by pointing to that needed salvation that He has won for us. We fight against these enemies with the gospel, with the good news that sin has been once and for all defeated by our Savior Jesus. By proclaiming that instead of receiving the punishment that we deserve, those who hold to Jesus receive the greatest of all rewards. 
And by attacking them with this sword of the Spirit, that is, by going out and by sharing this word, the good news of the gospel, we are actually going out, we are showing love to our enemies, aren't we? We are proclaiming our genuine concern for the eternal welfare, even of those who are hostile to us and persecute us. For we are going out and we are sharing with them this great treasure that we value so much. So dear friends, as we live in these later days where the world is very evil, do not find yourself caught off guard. Don't be surprised, and don't be worried about the evil that is surrounding us. Instead, realize that Jesus has already told us very plainly to expect it, to watch for it, and also to be ready and armed for it by holding and by committing ourselves to that very thing that the outside world hates so much, by holding to the bringer of our salvation, by clinging to the crucified, risen, and now ascended <clears throat> Lord Jesus. All glory be to him. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God which surpasses all human understanding, guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We join together now and sing our offertory. It's found printed on page 6 of our bulletin.